It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a teaching tutorial Thursday presented, of course, by DraftKings Sportsbook. Class is in session with, he's not a professor, I don't think, but he is a doctor. Dr. Chris Nowinski from the Concussion Legacy Foundation, a longtime friend of mine. We used to play against each other in college. No one, and I'll say this again when he's on, no one has done more to advance what we know and will continue to know about the impact of repetitive hits to the head on the brain than Chris Nowinski. I, and in fact, all of us, should be forever indebted to the work he's doing, which is why it's one of my major causes. You know, I go ahead and do the walk that was in um, May, the the 10K, which is awesome. I also wore sneakers to support the Concussion Legacy Foundation and what they're doing to end CTE. So big fan of Chris and what he does. I should mention a couple things real quick. Number one, since the interview, and really the entire show is pre-recorded, we will not have any Tux takes today. And I didn't pick any winners. So those of you that spread the word via social media, I love you, but I didn't pick a winner. Those of you that took advantage of a sponsor this week, I love you. I didn't pick a winner. Same with the YouTube shout out, but I am making a list. I'm like Santa Claus. I'm checking it twice. And I'm going to know who's been naughty or nice. And when I get back from my little vacay, I am going to pick winners. And I will notice those of you that did it here in July. And I will greatly, greatly appreciate those of you that did it here in early July. But you know what? We're kind of all winners, aren't we? When you get a chance to get a bold button down or a polo from Express, like I did recently, we're all winners. Look, it's nice to feel good. And you feel good when you look good. And you look good when you're kicking it old school with vintage inspired polos made for modern living or statement shirts in bright colors, prints that pop, and lightweight fabrics. Find something for every destination at Express online or in store it's big show time the big show as promised we are joined by a good friend of mine who used to be an adversary we talk about this every year i think i have him on the show once a year it's kind of my promise uh he thinks it's just because i'm helping him spread the word about the great work he's doing but actually It's my way of getting an update on everything going on with stuff that might affect me a little bit later. Uh, His name is Chris Nowinski. I think those of you that are longtime listeners, you know that. Uh, He is the founder of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Essentially, anything you've ever heard about CTE, Concussion Legacy Foundation, Chris has really led that charge. And and Chris, I know it's not just you, uh, Dr. Chris Nowinski, by the way. I know it's not just you and there are others involved, but I'm extremely proud of you, thankful for you. And as I've said before, you really are the person that's at the forefront for everything we know about CTE in general. And I guess, you know, trauma related to playing football or hitting your head a lot in, in particular. Well, you're kind to say that. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that I got into the space because I got hit in the head too much. And I'm really sad that I was right that CT is a far bigger problem than we thought it was, you know, 20 years ago. But, uh, you know, honored to work with you. And thank you again for pledging to donate your brain to me uh, when you pass away. I'm hoping you outlive me, though. I like you. <laughs> um, so a lot of questions. So first of all, follow Chris on Twitter at Chris Nowinski one Dr. Chris Nowinski. How many people, by the way, play football at Harvard, wrestle in the WWE, 
and then end up becoming a doctor. I mean, it's, you know, I got a pretty, I got a pretty cool (laughs) resume, but you, uh, yeah, yeah. You're the only one. Um, so I I guess the first question is what's the latest, you know, I I don't know that I've talked to you in a year about this. So I always kind of like getting the update. I think it's part of my job since it's such a big issue in the sport of football to have you on once a year and to get whatever the latest information is that we know. Anything new, anything noteworthy within the past year that we've learned? Great question, Ross. So the answer is, you know, science never moves as fast as you want. And so we, the story is mostly the same. We keep finding more cases of CTE. Uh, we keep making breakthroughs, in understanding how to diagnose it in life, why it's happening. Uh, we keep getting more resources brought to the game. The National Institutes of Health is funding now some new studies that we're recruiting for. Uh, we need athletes of all types uh, to sign up. So okay, go to the concussion uh, legacy, go to concussionfoundation.org and sign up for a clinical research registry to learn more. But um, you know, the, the reality is. What we probably learned is this this thing is just it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of work to learn how to cure CT. And the next step is learning how to diagnose it. One specific study that we got had published um recently was we learned that MRIs, you know, we've all had MRIs because we've been hitting the head too much, and it's a very common tool for imaging the brain. There are we are finding unique things about CT on MRIs of people we've diagnosed after they died and gone back and looked. And that that process of continuing to get more of those scans will help us tell you and me, you know, whether or not we have it before we pass away. One of the problems is um, every time we learn something new, I I go back to my MRIs and I go, oh, crap, Uh, because one of the things that we talked about uh, that one of the things we published was there's a membrane in the middle of your brain that uh, and that membrane in CTE falls apart and. that it's very obvious in MRI and it's almost always associated with CTE. And so it's a sign that, that we can see. And last time I had an MRI, I had the beginnings of it. And the question is, in some people it's static and some people it's degenerative. And I, I'm scared to go back in an MRI to find out if mine's worse, because if it's worse, that's, that's a pretty, uh, pretty straight confirmation. Wow, that's so interesting that, you know, your work can also kind of put you in a position where, but you'd rather know. I mean, that's why you're doing all this. You'd rather know. That's a big, that's a big question, right? So there's actually been studies on genetic probabilities of you developing Alzheimer's. There's certain genes that give you a very high risk. And they did a study of, should we tell people they have that gene? And what they found was some people deal with it really well, live life to the fullest, knowing that they might have a shorter lifespan and other people lost their minds right? That it was just a mental health struggle knowing like, oh my God, like is tomorrow am I going to fall apart? Is that going to be the day I can't remember things? And so it really comes down to whether or not you should know has a lot to do with your personal profile. And it's a risk to find out you have this disease. I mean, it's sort of like, how do some people handle knowing they're going to die and other people don't, you know, like we're all going to die. Like bad things are going to happen in the future medically, but having a specific thing to look at and track and focus on can be bad for your mental health. And so I don't know if I want to roll that dice uh, myself. Wow. That, that, that is really interesting. Um, you know, it's funny. You could you said science is never as fast as you want it to be. I mean, that's, that's why it's science, right? You know, that you're, you're making sure you're, you're, there's a scientific process. If it was, if it was drive through science, it really wouldn't be, or fast food science, right? It really wouldn't be science because, It wouldn't go through the critical processes it needs to, to be able to really give us the information we're looking for. Uh, Yeah, I guess the uh, the one of the questions I have is you said early on we're making advances towards identifying CTE in living people. Um, What are those? And then I guess kind of what's the end game there? Like, let's say you can identify in living people. You even just said you're not even sure if you would tell people or not. So what's the greatest value in that? Is it, you know, you can tell an athlete, hey, you already have it. You might want to stop playing. What do you see as the greatest value in being able to identify it in living people? 
Yeah, that that part's unlikely because we also know that diagnosing the beginnings of it is a thousand times harder than diagnosing it when it's been there for 30 years because we're looking for tiny lesions in the brain when you're in your teens and 20s. And then when you're 70, 80, it's everywhere. And so to give an example, we're constantly recruiting athletes, especially ex-NFL players, to studies using a PET scan. So it's a more advanced type of imaging of the brain than MRI, where they literally inject you with a radioactive compound that it can go into the bloodstream, into the brain, and attach to tau protein, which is the, uh, the, the thing that goes wrong with CTE. And so we have been recruiting NFL players to studies using uh, tau tracers designed for Alzheimer's disease because it's sort of a sister disease. The unfortunate thing we're finding out, I think, is that the things that were designed for Alzheimer's may not work for CTE. And so it's, it's critical that we keep trying to get more people focused on the disease for CTE because it will need its own focused ways of diagnosing it. With that said, though, we've also had some breakthroughs looking at the blood. And and the sad thing to think about is that when your brain's degenerating, literally you get brain proteins floating in your bloodstream because your brain is sort of rotting, going through the blood-brain barrier, and these pieces of brain are in your blood. And we're picking up that the you, we can identify potentially CTE disease pieces of brain in your blood and distinguish them from Alzheimer's disease. So a blood test may end up being the thing you get in the doctor's office in 10 years where they say, oh, God, you have way too many CT proteins floating around. Um, that's, you know, you have CTE and it looks bad. So um, the reason that we're doing this is not to tell people that they have it necessarily. The reason we're doing this is because if we want to intervene, if we want to get big pharma off the sideline and, tr and doing clinical trials on will this drug stop your CTE, we have to be able to know who has it. If you start a clinical trial and you put a bunch of patients in there and you're treating people who don't actually have CTE, you're going to destroy a drug's future. And it's not that it doesn't work. It's because you're studying the wrong people. So we are racing towards this diagnosis. And then once we have it, like it's all hands on deck, let's all go get these new, new treatments and let's all try to figure out which one will stop or slow the progression of the disease so that we can live long, healthy lives. So big pharma doesn't want to invest in making drugs until there would be documented people that the drugs are for. Correct. That's why you need to know who has it in living people because once they know, okay, all these people, this many people have it. Okay, well, let's come up with drugs that help these people. That's how you sell drugs. And that's the other part of it is we don't know how prevalent the disease is. And so, right, if we can prove that 100,000 people in the U.S. have it, there's a there's money to be made for Big Pharma. So you, um, but between the blood and you said it's a lot easier to identify it in the lesions on MRIs of people in their 70s and 80s than, you know, younger people. It sounds like you can diagnose it in living people. We, we, so the way all diagnoses for similar diseases works is you have a criteria of you have A, B, C, and not one, two, three. And we basically, if your grandmother's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, a doctor is using this criteria and they can say with 80% confidence, this is what they have. But we still find out those people don't, they have another reason why their brain isn't working. And we don't have that number. So we don't have, if you have the cavum and you have atrophy of the frontal lobe and the ratio between your frontal lobe to your, uh, your parietal lobe atrophy is different. We, we don't have that yet. And so these are all pieces to the puzzle that we'll put together and then be able to test. And then we get that number of this diagnostic panel is 80% accurate for predicting CT, then it's, then we're ready to go forward. Got it. Okay. Um, any, any new information on slowing symptoms? Um, obviously, you know, I'm sure you have people that come to you that you highly suspect have CTE, um, or are struggling. H have we done any research on ways to slow the symptoms or, you know, sort of preventative measures. Yeah. So I th there's, we, again, we don't know how any proven way to slow the symptoms because we don't know if the symptoms are caused by uh, CTE because we don't know who has it, right? So 
the, the, on the preventative side, you know, we launched last year Operation Brain Health. So basically the messaging there, and, and it's, it started as folks to the military who's been exposed to TBI and BLAST and, and truly for everybody. If you think you're at risk for this, if you've had a lot of exposure to head impacts, if, if you played too much football, you still are in control of some portion of your brain's destiny. And that's through exercise, diet, and social activities, not smoking, you know, not getting diabetes, all these other things. And so Operation Brain Health speaks to those things of, you know, hey, you know, we're ex linemen. We got really big. We got to lose weight. We got to keep losing weight. We got to do all these things to, you know, we got to stay away from alcohol as much as we can, drugs, all these things that'll keep our brain healthy. Even if CT's in there, you can make it worse by compounding other problems on there. So that's that part. In terms of treatment, I will say that we've had success with some people that have, you know, there's part of what happens we think with CT is that like, the, the, the big thing that is very clear is that your memory falls apart, your ability to executive functioning, hold a job, goal focused behaviors, you start making sort of odd choices. That, um, that's definitely CT related. And then we think there's this mental health component that sort of comes earlier for some people, but doesn't come for everybody, where you have depression, anxiety, uh, addiction issues, violence, impulsiveness, you know, gambling, all these interesting things that people have. Um, that some people die in that area and some people were able to pull out. Some people recognize it, get the right treatment, get the right medications for their symptoms, lifestyle interventions, uh, sleep interventions, family uh, education. And if you, so if you're having those midlife issues, you can get pulled out, but we also know we can't pull out everybody. Um, recently, uh, you know, I, I we, we've talked about this over email, but I lost, one of my teammates from Harvard who played in the NFL, uh, Chris Eitzman, who was, uh, you know, Tom Brady's uh, roommate or housemate his rookie year with the Patriots and played you know, three years in the league. And um, he started having some mental health issues and uh, d developed into alcoholism. And, and I, you know, I did everything we could. We took him to all the right doctors, you know, the whole team came together to try to support him, but we couldn't pull him out of the spiral. And he passed away in December. And so we're studying him right now. And, uh, you know, that's, it, it feels like a big failure, right? That we're supposed to be able to help everybody, but, you know, even for someone, you know, someone I was roommates with came to my wedding, like we couldn't pull him out of the spiral. So uh, it's, it's, it's really important that, you know, you continue to su support and I appreciate it. And that we get a little more aggressive on this thing. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, and I, I know we talked about email or text or whatever, um, Really, really sorry for your loss again. And I, I remember Chris being a heck of a player in the Ivy League, that's for sure. And then uh, in the NFL. Um, speaking of that, um, you know, I know listeners, you know, saw me do it this year uh, or last year, I should say. The partnership with the Cleveland Marathon. Why has that uh, been such a good partnership for you guys? And why is that so important? Yeah, so the the Cleveland Marathon, we're we're an official charity of, and they've been a great friend of the organization. As we start to expand our awareness and, and fundraising activities, and so they do the marathon every May, and uh, they let us put a team together last year, and, and seventy people uh, raised one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars. We had all these college alumni teams uh, competing against each other. Uh, he did a great job co captaining Princeton, but Cornell crushed all of us, which is a huge surprise to anyone knows. <laughs> um, but but we, it was a, it was a great fundraise. But what we uh, what they allowed us to do is now going forward, we're gonna have our own sort of branded race. It's called the Race to NCTE, and the idea is that you know we're, we're we it's a race. Like we are literally need to get there as fast as we can to NCT, which both means developing treatments, but also means prevention. Right? Like if we stop hitting people in the head, especially children will dramatically reduce future CT cases. And so um, where this will be an every year thing, and we encourage anyone to sign up and just Google the race 10 CTE and um, enjoy the team, start a team, pull your ex teammates together. A lot of families are running in honor of a loved one they've lost because we've now diagnosed probably 700 people with CTE at the brain bank um, over the last 15 years. So, um, yeah, I'm excited that you continue to participate in co-captain at Princeton team, which is, which is, you know, an impressive group of co-captains. And so uh, thanks for doing it. 
So, uh, well, it's the least I can do, and it's absolutely my pleasure. You know how thankful I am for everything you guys do. You know, Chris, I know you've likened it previously to smoking, where it's like the more you smoke, the worse it is for you. The more hits to the head you take, the worse it is for you. But some people can smoke a pack a day and they don't get lung cancer. Other people can smoke one cigarette uh, every day and, and they do get it. Is that still an apt comparison? And do we have any idea how many people it really affects or what, what percentage of NFL players, what percentage of college players, or is that impossible based on how long you played in the NFL or when you started playing football? Great question. So yes, the smoking analogy still works. Uh, what's, what's accurate about it is it's always important to say your CT risk is when, if you're a football player where we have by far the most data is not driven by how many concussions you had or think you had, but is driven by how many years you play, which is an approximation of how many thousands of hits to the head you took. Like football is, is, is sort of a CTE creating machine. The idea that for, for five, four to six months a year, you're getting hit in the head 50 times a week. And that um, somehow is, is causing CT in way too many people. We publish that your odds of developing CT go up uh, each year. And so it's sort of like an exponential curve. And it does look a lot like the smoking curves. The only difference I would say, though, is that like we know there are people who smoke for 50 years who never develop lung cancer. We don't. If you get up to 20, 30 years of football, very few people in our data have avoided CT. So there are people who still can, but um, the way we've been playing, it's it's uh, it's it's bad. It's ugly data, and we're picking up signals in the data that you know we we just diagnosed a young man who played in the era of safer football and had more advanced CT than some Hall of Famers who played in eras ago. Bigger, stronger, faster is driving worst cases of CT in younger people. Um, but what was the second part of your question? <laughs> so smoking works. Yeah, so they, they tell you they tell you not to do it, uh, to, not to ask one question, uh, more than one question. I think I did like five there. It, it was just if you had any approximation Based uh, yes. Upon, uh, percentages based upon if you just played in high school, college, NFL, whatever. So we, we don't uh, for high school, college, we do for NFL. So I'll, uh, when you look at a brain bank sample, you, you basically get people who are more likely to have the disease because they had something wrong in their life that you know, made the family think this could be CT. And so right. over represents positive cases. So we have 16 of our first 65 high school football players had CT, but I don't think, and I hope 25% of high school players don't have it. It's probably way less than that. We're getting maybe the worst of the worst. When it comes to college, um, I think about 70% of our sample, which is hundreds have had it. And that definitely tells us that families are very good at diagnosing it, but also it's way too easy to find. The NFL, though, is where we do have data. And so one way to analyze it is that we've gotten the brains. We got between 20, 2008 and 2015, we got the brains of 10% of NFL players who died. And nearly 100% of them had it, meaning the minimum risk for an NFL player if you stepped on the field is 10%. That's one way to analyze that data. Another way to analyze it, how many people had it out of the um, – uh, another way to analyze, analyze it by uh, somebody at OSHA has suggested uh, 16% is the minimum. But we now get more NFL players than we have in the past. So we have a better idea. And I, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I would be shocked if when we can diagnose as living people, it's less than 50% based on what we know today. You'd be shocked if... Less than 50% of NFL players get CT. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think we, we, we've gotten more accurate in understanding and, and I, you d just, I'll eventually be able to back this up with data, but I think it's very unlikely to be less than 50%. And but as we discussed, it could manifest itself that there's another layer to it, right, Chris, which is it, it could manifest itself very differently in one person from the next. 
Correct. So we all think about the Aaron Hernandez Jr. say out young, massive changes in personality, suicide, crisis, violence, whatever. Um, most people that are getting diagnosed with CT who played in the NFL are dying older. We are seeing people get dementia in their 50s, but we're also seeing people who were no symptoms until their 70s or 80s. But I will say that those people had no symptoms until their 70s or 80s were linemen playing at 200 pounds, right? Like the, they weren't taking the same hits and they weren't starting as young as we do today. So I don't think that's an, but the so point is that, you know, we would, I think, all hope to live the Nick Bonacani life, which was he was a hugely successful after his NFL career, titan of industry, CEO, raised half a billion dollars for charity, all this stuff. Um, and he started struggling, um, I think, early 70s, late 60s, or maybe a little, uh, I don't have exactly, but older. Like he, he had a long, successful life and, you know, work life and all that stuff. Then he, they had a very hard death. But, um, you know, that's sort of a, probably a best case scenario for maybe guys like you or me, that if we had it, we'd still like, it wouldn't be a problem in our life until our seventies. Check him out on social media at Chris Nowinski one at concussion LF for the concussion legacy foundation. Uh, can't highly encourage you guys enough to support it in any way that you can. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show as always. For us, always great to see you, my friend. Thank you. Really hope you guys got something out of that and enjoyed it as much as I do. You know, I'm guessing some of you don't want to hear that. Some of you don't want to be in the know or aware. You know, you'd rather be in a ignorance is bliss situation. And I got to be honest with you, I'm okay with that. You know, to each his own. That's not how I want to be on that topic. I want to be informed. And I want to be supportive of the work they're doing that will help me someday and other football players. But the same way that I don't really pay attention to, you know, news or current events because I don't like the negativity. If if that's negativity that you don't want to have to deal with, then I understand if you choose not to listen to that interview or if you didn't love the interview, that's fine. That's what makes the world go round. I will say this, though. I love the I think we're done here members of patreon.com slash RT media. And I certainly hope you guys checked out Drew Dinsick's season win total bets on the Even Money podcast. If you're not into betting at all, all that means is Drew talked about the teams he thinks are better or worse than other people do. That's really all it means. And he and I had a chat about it. And then yesterday on the Fantasy Feast, I did the first part of my offensive line rankings. It was basically me talking the whole time. So it's basically like another Raw Sucker football podcast that you can listen to tomorrow or Saturday or Sunday or whenever. Shout outs though to Evergreen Economics, go-bangles.com, steakhousesports.com, humanheadnyc.com, sportaculture, and Pizza Boy Brewing. Have a fantastic weekend, all of you. We will be back with a little GC. Greg Cosell, bright and early Monday morning. Want to get to those the rest of those quarterbacks because there's a, another guy that he is really high on that we didn't get to this week, as well as talk about the top wide receivers a little bit. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.